our event in this afternoon, we would like to call one of the VIBD Alaf student, Muhammad Firdaus bin Muhammad Saleh, to recite the Surah Al Fatiha and the Doa Islam. Al Fatiha Tabil Kabul, Watanami Sukli Kulima Makmul, was Salah his Shatnil Zahir or Beltin and Fiddini, what Dunya or Akhara, Dafiat and Nikulishan in Jali, but in the Khairil Dana, what Ihababina, what you were Lidina, what Mashaikina, Fiddini, Mount Lutfi, Mount Afia. وعلى نية أن الله يجعل مجلسنا هذا المجلس على Convention 3.0-2020 محاط بالخيرات والمسرات والأنوار والبركات وينور قلوبنا ما الطقاء والهدى والعفاف والموت على دين الإسلام والإيمان بلا محنة ولا امتهان ويقضي لنا جميع هاجات بحق سيدنا محمد صلى الله على عليه وآله وسلم الفاتحة ثابكم الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين أمين 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 بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم إنا نستفزغ ونستودعك ديننا وإيماننا وأنفسنا وأهلنا وأولادنا وذرياتنا والمسلمين وأموالنا وكل شيء نعطيتنا اللهم اجعلنا وإياهم في كنفك وإيمانك وجوارك وعيادك من كل شيطان مريد وجبار عنيد وذيع وذي بغي ومن شر كل ذي شر إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم جملنا بالصحة والسلامة وحققنا بالتقوى والاستقامة وعدنا من مجبات الندامة في الهال والمآل إنك مجيب الدعوات اللهم إنا نسألك سلامة في الدين وعافية في الجسد وزيادة في العلم وبركة في الرزق وتوبة قبل الموت ورحمة عند الموت ومغفرة بعد الموت اللهم هون علينا في سقرات الموت والنجاة من النار اللهم اغفر لنا ورحمنا ووالدينا ومشيخنا ووالديهم وإخواننا وأخواتنا ولمن أحسن إلينا والمؤمنين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اختم لنا بيسر الخاتمة ولا تختم علينا بسوء الخاتمة ربنا آدنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذابا النار وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم بفضلك سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين 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 يا رب العالمين Thank you for those Without any further ado let us start our event this year is the third year of the IBD Alaf Convention and the theme will be on IoT plus 4IR which stands for Internet of Things plus 4th Industrial Revolution. It is about the digitalization of Brunei in the 4th Industrial Revolution where the student will give their speech based, based on their opinion about it from 5G wireless technology to holographic teaching to virtual Reality. Here's a question. What if we were private and automatic give us research in school? Would not that be interesting? Yes. Let me begin with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And hello everyone, my name is Sharifuddin and I stand before you today to present my topic on providing automatic give us research in school. Before I start, I want to tell you that some schools allow students to bring their handphone and laptop to school for learning purposes. For example, Jordan International School. They should have a chat session. This then will allow students to have fully charged 
batteries on their device. If you want to know, research areas should be provided in the school for students and even teachers. This is to allow smooth learning processes when using the lab, using the ICT lab. Without the research station, student or teacher sometimes may feel learning disruption when the battery on the device is low. Additionally, I think the room should have camera for security, table for putting the device, and also plugs with different head for charge different brand of handphone and laptop. Don't forget that internet should also be provided for online purposes. In terms of school discipline, some schools, like government schools, do not allow students to bring their handphone. Laptops are also not necessary to laptop are also not necessary as some schools like my school do not offer ICT as a subject. However, for schools that actually offer ICT, it will be magnificent to have charging station built just like Interna Brunei International Airport. That's all for today. Thank you for listening. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I noticed that you've been staring at me, so I'll let you to have a few seconds to catch your breath. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and hello everyone, I'm Dania. Before I start my presentation, I want to know does anyone here know what cloud computing is? It's okay if you never heard of it because today I'm going to enlighten you about cloud computing. Cloud computing is an automatic copier or archiver via Wi-Fi in instances of data loss, data theft, and easy data access. To summarize, it plays a big role in transferring files. I'm sure that everyone here know what USB is, right? So basically, cloud computing has the same function as USB, but it is wireless and requires an internet connection, which means that you can use cloud computing anywhere you want. Like USB, cloud computing stores and backup data. Your data are sent to a secure facility and rent a space for your data to be stored and backup. As you can see on my slide, um, that is the Cloud Apple US facility where your data, uh, where the space is for your data to be stored and backup. During the lockdown, I was given an important assignment way before the due date. I sent my assignment through emails, but sadly, my teacher did not receive it. I thought that my files were back up. In the end, I had no choice but to do it again. Even though I managed to redo my assignments, I was traumatized. From then on, I learned to always back up my files no matter what. Therefore, I believe that cloud computing is essential as it benefits everyone. It is cost-friendly and we can access better learning materials at home. Be besides that, we can save our important data on the cloud. For instance, students don't have to bring their USB if they need to back up their files because cloud computing can be accessed via smartphones as well as computers. Not only that, students don't need to worry about carrying around devices as cloud computing is wireless. They can enjoy the academic information anytime and anywhere. That's all from me. Thank you so much. Hello, guys. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, has anyone heard that before? Yes. yes. I'm yeah. Thanks to the internet, adolescents nowadays can engage themselves with media materials and create their own contents in where their parents could not. But can they be called content creators? So firstly, we need to know what is a content creator. A content creator is someone who produces entertaining or educational 
material that caters to the interests and challenges of a target audience. The content creator produces many forms of content, including blog posts, videos, photos, ebooks, and infographic. Where do they share their contents? They share their contents on apps such as YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and more. So technically, yes, they are content creator, where in some way, we all are. However, why did they choose to become a content creator? What are the pros? Adolescents can earn money at a very young age. For example, Adalia Ross, a 14 years old YouTuber, earned $146,000 a year in 2017. Wow, we can't even get a dollar without asking our parents. Next, the apps are free. Who doesn't like free things? The adolescents can share their contents without spending money on the sharing apps. Lastly, being a content creator, they have the ability to connect and also make new friends. Imagine you are a YouTuber and you receive a message from, from another YouTuber, such as PewDiePie, uh, saying that they wanted to collaborate. I personally would be so shocked and excited. Despite that, there's also cons for being content creator. Anxiety inducing. There are no guarantee people are going to watch or read your content. And also, they will be time wasting when you make your content for days or hours, but no one is interested. How will you feel? I will feel worthless. Next, last focus on education. I'm not worried about the behavior of student here because all of you are clever, but if you want to become a content creator, just remember you will have to spend more time on content making rather than studying. Lastly, content creating can make you stress. It's hard to study and make contents every single day. It will put a huge pressure on you, and what's more, there's toxic people out there that like to discourage you. Finally, it's up to you to become an adolescent content creator. Actually, I myself am also interested in content making. Just follow what you want to do, and hopefully you can be happy doing it. I'm Rahiman, and thank you for listening. To start with, do you have a family member that are in the Pusat Bahagia, in the special needs education? Do you even know what a special needs education mean? Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm Etta, and today I will talk about gesture and emotional recognition technology in special needs education. I decided to choose this topic because I have family member that cannot see very well and an, autis and an autistic cousin. I heard that most of the children are having difficulties in doing their daily activities. To start my speech, what is special needs education? They are children with learning difficulties compared to children their age. For example, children with physical disabilities and children with neuron, neuron divergent conditions such as that dyslexia. There is so much you can do to help these children to have a normal life. With the availability of advanced technology, people are inventing numerous aids in order to help these children such as electrical wheelchair to help them move, be to, to help them move around, Braille keyboard and eye stick for the blind community, cochlear implant for the deaf community, text-to-speech text to speech software for uh, dyslexia, and AAC device for autism. AAC is a short term for augmentative and alternative, alternative communication devices. But what about recognizing their emotion and gestures? It is known that most, most passionate children are very sensitive and unexpressive, and this makes it harder for us to understand their feelings. The innovation to further understand their difficulties, a man named Tan Lee invented an emotive EPOC neuro headset that uses electroencephalogram EEG. EEG is the brainwave technology that are used in this headset. This headset can detect the user thought, emotions, and expressions in real time. Other than this headset, artificial intelligence is also used to detect emotions. It is called Emotion AI. This machine can recognize, under, recognize understand, and react to human emotion. This is what Patrick, this is what Patrick Leverosotis said regarding the Emotion AI. Since gesture is physical movement, I am focusing more on people with physical disabilities. Electromyography EMG reflects what is happening in the brain to evaluate nerve cells and muscle functions. 
So this will be more convenient for people suffering quadriplegics. My thought on EEG and EMG technology is just for people suffering paralysis. Furthermore, people with amputated body parts can wear artificial limbs without using technology. In conclusion, with this technology, the special needs children can be more independent when doing their daily activities, thus making us understand their feelings and emotion better. Before I end my speech, I would like to say that with being innovative is the way to go because with that mindset, we can start to invent machines that may help the communities and save lives. That's all from me. Thank you for listening. Imagine controlling everything with just your brain, without having to move any muscle. That's right, just your brain. There are times when you are just too lazy to switch off the lights, or when the remote control is far away, and you just don't want to move because you are already comfortable lying on your bed or your sofa. In this situation, of course, you wish you can send mind reading signals to the switches to turn off itself and for the TV to change channels itself. Wouldn't that be convenient? Well, these scenarios might soon become a reality thanks to the development of the brain-computer interfaces, which is BCI. For those who don't know what a BCI is, to put it in simpler terms, think of BCI as a bridge between your brain and an external device. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and hello everyone. My name is Masnur and today I am going to present to you the uses of BCI technologies. Well, BCI technologies are definitely useful for most people. But instead of automatically switching lights off or just changing channels, BCI technologies were mostly made to help the disabled. For instance, for the deaf communities. Researchers have created BCI technologies called cochlear implant. Though it does not cure hearing loss, instead provides an opportunity for them to experience a sense of sound. Although this is an invasive BCI, which means that this Implants have to be surgically inserted into the brain. Subsequently, what about the non-invasive BCI? This non-invasive BCI does not need surgery, but instead sensors are placed on the scalp to measure the electrical potential produced by the brain, which uses EEG, or the magnetic field, which uses MEG. There are already numerous inventions made around non-invasive BCI and this invention have different uses. For example, the person in this picture is using P300 BCI. He is sitting comfortably and clasping both his hands. And while playing chess, he is moving the bishop without even having to move his hand. I'm sure it's mind-blowing, but I'm not so sure he will win though. Another example is BCI enables people with disabilities to drive car autonomously. They don't even have to worry about steering their cars. For example, this racing toy car moves when the person using it is focused and stop when they are relaxed. I know some of you might be thinking right now, how is that even possible? Well, a famous American science fiction author once said, everything is theoretically impossible until it is done. That's all from me. Thank you for listening. Do you have any idea what virtual reality is? Virtual reality, or VR for short, is a computer-generated simulation in which a person can interact with an artificial three-dimensional image. It immerses the user into a virtual world. How does it work? When we put on a VR headset, it takes us to a simulated setup making us completely aloof from the actual surrounding. I'm Hadi, and I will be talking about the uses of VR in remote learning. There are also advantages of using the VR for remote learning. Here is my opinion of the advantages of using the VR. First, it creates interest to students. Most of the students love to sit and watch something instead of reading it. The VR technology is quite interesting as it can create amazing experiences that could never be lived in the real life. Students will definitely, will definitely feel more motivated to learn with the use of this technology. If you can make the education fun, 
students will love to learn more stuff and be more ambitious. For example, like this picture. Second, it is easy to access, meaning that all the students are easy to attend the class without ironing their school uniform. Therefore, there, therefore, they will not bother their parents to send them to school. Just imagine, nowadays teachers find it real hard to create a productive engagement within the class due to the, due to the crisis of the pandemic. So with the help of the VR, teachers can see their students face to face. In conclusion, furthermore, all technologies that have been used until now may be sufficient for us, but a little innovation will, up, will make our lives more convenient. Therefore, let us turn virtual reality technology a norm to this world. If my school introduced the use of VR learning, I would not hesitate to wake up in the morning to go to school and start learning. Won't you feel the same way too? Okay, that's all from me. Thank you and assalamualaikum. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Imagine that you are the tourist and you're going to another country, but you can speak their language. How would you talk with the locals then? We have apps such as Google Translator to aid us in this kind of situation. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for being here. I'm Al Maldina and I'm here going to present how to localize real-time speech translation in the tourism industry. I choose this topic because I feel that there is a need to raise awareness of the loss of translation costs. How does real-time speech translation work? Real-time speech translation requires the use of modern technology. We can use apps to translate languages in a matter of minutes. Here are some examples of the translation apps. First is the Google Translator that can be used by Android and iOS only. Second, iTranslate can be used by Android only. Third, Speak and Translate can be used only by iOS. What do, they, what do these apps use? First, the Google Translator enables translation from text and website from one language to another. Second, iTranslate helps translate using the cameras. Third, speak and translate can translate to another language with real-time voice recognition. Why do we need to localize real-time speech translation in the tourism industry? Is it because they fear to diversify these translation apps? As an example, in Brunei, we have a different tribes that speak different languages. We are unable to translate their language into Google Translate. Imagine that you're going to Tamburong and there are a lot of Brit, Iban, and Murut tribes. But how do we communicate with them if we don't know their language? We can communicate with them if these translation apps include diversity languages. Besides, this app can also boost the tourism industry because language barrier will not be an issue anymore. That brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you. I sincerely appreciate your attention today. Assalamualaikum. Just imagine if a physically disabled person can drive and travel to any destination that they desire, isn't that futuristic and convenient? There is a way to achieve this. I would like to introduce you the brand new concept of a brain contour car. But firstly, I would like to ask everyone, who do you think uses artificial intelligence? Everyone. Artificial intelligence, AI for short, is a robot controlled computer executing tasks that are usually done by humans because robots lack human intelligence. My name is Mohammed Ferdaus, and now I will present to you my topic, Brain Control Car. What do you know about Brain Control Car? Or in another word, what do you understand by the sentence, Mind Control Machine? A Brain Control Car, or a Mind Control Machine, is electronic devices that are, that are controlled primarily by our brain. There are many advantages to having a Brain Control Car. Firstly, for a visually impaired person, 
they can use this kind of modern technology to make their life easier. If they want to leave the, comf the comfort of their house, they can, they can make use of this technology. Put on this TG adapted device and the car will move by itself depending on the brain signal sent by the driver. A closely related example of self-driving cars is Tesla that uses AI to drive cars using GPS. Secondly, a brain-controlled car is not only catered to the physically or mentally challenged. Everyone can make use of this technology. Imagine a situation where you are late for work and you have to send your children to school. And at the same time, everyone needs to eat their breakfast. You can save time by, by eating your breakfast in your car. This might, while it drives itself. Despite all these advantages, unfortunately, there are also disadvantages to this technology. For instance, miscoding might cause malfunction in system errors. This might cause a car crash and threaten lives. Furthermore, what if the driver fainted while he is driving? Will the car continue to drive? Or will the engine shut down by itself, following the driver's loss of consciousness? These are some things we need to prioritize before we are building them. The invention of the brain control car will, will surely be one of the best technologies invited as it will bring many benefits to consumers. But there are also issues that we need to consider, which bring us to a very important question. Would you let AI to control your life? Thank you. That's from me. Can we predict the future? What if we can predict how tall we will be, how heavy we will weigh, and how healthy we will be in the future? The answer to these questions is yes, we can. Hello, I'm Nabila, and today I'm going to share with you on how to take a little yet precise sneak peek to our future self. We can use newly developed technology called DNA computing. DNA-based computing is an emerging branch of computing that uses DNA, biochemistry, molecular biology hardware instead of using the silicon-based te based computer technology to map our genes. This magnificent invention was invented in 2018 by Michigan State University. This is my late grandma. She passed away in October this year after suffering from cancer. When we, and when we realized that she was sick, it was too late. The cancer cells had spread to other parts of her organs before we can even come up with, an, come up with a treatment plan. Following that incident, my whole family was anxious and was worried that all of us might have any and underlying illnesses that we never unaware of. Now, we don't have to worry anymore. Medical technology has slept massively and gave us a chance to predict our health conditions for years to come. This advanced technology can identify our genes and it can forecast if we have any disease code genes or if we carry any hereditary illnesses. We have heard this quote religiously before. Prevention is better than cure. I believe everyone in this room never doubted this quote, right? Imagine if there's a giant rock falling 100 feet from the sky. We saw it and we will, and we will know when and where it will fall. Will you just stand still on that predicted spot? Or will you run for your life and live a long, happy life? Of course, we will want to scurry away. Consequently, why must we wait for the disease to destroy our precious body. I want everyone to have a chance to live a happy and healthy life. Even though we cannot go beyond Allah's plan, but He told us to change our faith to be better. As stated in Al-Quran, Allah will not change the condition of people until they change what is in themselves. Maybe we are fated to have cardiac arrest in five years, or maybe we are fated to have a long healthy life. Although we are facing an uncertain future, we cannot just do anything and convince ourselves that everything's going to be fine. 
DNA-based computing can take us five years ahead, and we can start taking precaution steps little by little before we fall ill. The first step towards getting somewhere is to decide that you are not going to stay who you are. This is Nabila, and thank you for listening. Assalamualaikum. Have you ever wondered how autopilot can simply fly a plane without pilot controlling the panels? Hello, my name is Hakim, and I am here to talk about what is about artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? Artifi AI for short. Artificial intelligence is a man-made machine that can acquire and apply skill to, to execute a task. With technology advancing day by day, some people are afraid that AI would be a threat for us. Thus, it raises the question, is AI is really beneficial to us or does it bring threat to us? What you can see on the screen are the benefits of AI. Financial trading, aviation and self-driving automobiles, big data research, hospital and medicine, aids for the disabled people. One of the easiest examples of these benefits is the one that we use daily, mobile phones. <coughs> these devices can store information as well as ensuring us to have a well-being. For example, in Brunei Darussalam, the Ministry of Health launched an app called Blue Health, which helped us to lower the infection rate of COVID-19. Just like now, before you enter this event hall, you guys scan the code, right, via the app? Yes. This to aid the government to do their contact tracing. Other than that, AI can also help doctors save lives. For instance, as you can see in that picture, this machine is called Da Vinci Surgery System, which can help doctors perform surgery accurate and precisely. AI can also help the disabled co communities. For example, the famous scientist Stephen Hawking also used them to relay his theories. Although there are although there are benefits to using AI, there are also tests that we should consider. AI one AI could potentially end mankind, decrease employment rates, and affect the environment. I understand that people are worried about AI threatening the extinction of mankind. Even scientists have warned us multiple times about this, including Stephen Hawking and even Elon Musk. As Stephen Hawking quoted, the, the, de the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of mankind. Meaning if we give AI its mind, its own mind, it's terrifying on how fast they could evolve compared to us. All in all, personally, I think AI is definitely beneficial to us human mankind. Thank you. Take a look at this picture. Do you think this animal is endangered? Yes. To answer that question, that animal is in fact critically endangered and are now estimated to become extinct in the next few years. Now, why do you think they are endangered? One of the reasons is because of illegal poaching, which brings us to my main topic for today. Assalamu alaikum and hello, my name is Akila, and today I am telling you facts about illegal poaching activities with barcodes. There was a famous Brazilian model named Banchan who lived in Brazil. Before she actually worked as a model, she was just an ordinary girl. She was just an ordinary girl, girl who takes a picture on the side of the street. Somehow, a model agency found her and offered her a job. In 2001, she became famous and was working with multiple clients. But unfortunately, she was caught doing illegal poaching activities and since then, many agencies started to terminate her contract. What do I mean by poaching activities? 
Poaching is the ill is the killing of endangered or protected animals in a prohibited manner. Poachers does these unlawful activities to produce rare animal products such as rhinos are killed for their horns which is used as its medicinal value. There are several ways to track illegal poaching activities and some of them are by GPS, cameras and sensors but it wasn't a success. However, recently the authorities started to use barcodes as a way to detect illegal poaching activities. Barcodes are usually used for a quick identification of products and in this case an animal. Barcode of Wildlife Project uses DNA barcoding to track illegal poaching. Now you're thinking, what is DNA barcoding? It's just simply a method of species identification using DNA taken from the animal genes. Lab workers create a unique barcode for each species of animal and create a unique sequence for every animal. Now, how do scientists use DNA barcoding? If poachers were caught with, identif with identified animal remains, the scientists can take a sample of the horn and analyze their genes to match with the specific and unique barcode they have created. With that being said, wildlife researchers can identify which animals are killed the most so that they can focus on trying to save this animal. It does sound like it's a hard work, but researchers are willing to do this to save our wildlife and environment. If poaching were to continue, there is a possibility that all wildlife will eventually become extinct. Be kind to our next generation and give them a chance to see wildlife in front of their eyes. That's all for now. Thank you. On the first day of the third BIBD Love Convention 2020, each one of us is given a topic that was personal to us and was asked to present them. Assalamu alaikum and good morning. My name is Mama Azizwan, and today I will talk about power efficiency and security in smart home. Smart home is referred to a convenient home that can be controlled without you having to physically switch appliances on and off. It allows the user to connect appliances through one center point, such as our smartphone, tablet, and laptop. It enables you to control the appliances at any time and anywhere you want. One of, the, one of the common cases that are found when not using smart home was house fires. From this slide, you can see in 2004 only, there were 103 emergency calls directed to the fire and rescue department. An estimated damage was worth 8.66 million of Bruneian dollar, and it was recorded there were five deaths. Another common cases in Brunei is burglary. In 2006, there was reported 1.148.5 cases per 100,000 population in 2006. As you can see from the table on the slide, there's an obvious increase from 2003 to 2006. However, by using smart home, we can prevent this from happening. One of the advantage of having smart, smart home is you can manage your home all in one place. Imagine, this one place. If you want to earn, to turn on the alarm, you have to walk all the way there to, reach, uh, to switch it on. If you want to turn the air conditioner, you have, to go, you have to walk all the way back there to open it. But now, you can do it just using your phone. Just being able to keep all the technology through one device is a massive step forward to a better technology and home management. Secondly, smart home maximizes home security. When you incorporate security and surveillance features in your smart home network, your home security will be better and more secure. You can choose to receive any message or reminder if anyone is in your house. This will prevent any cases of burglary. Thirdly, smart home can increase energy efficiency. Depending on how you use the smart home technology, it's possible for you to save more energy. Light can switch on and off when you enter or leave your room. And lastly, smart home can ensure home management inside. For the type of person who like to track back and check your activity daily, this would be a perfect feature for you. 
you can monitor how often you watch TV, what kind of food you cook, and from this end, you can analyze your daily habit and make an adjustment to reach your target lifestyle. To end this presentation, Wendy Wunder from The Probability of Miracle have quoted that the magic thing about home is that it feels good to live and it feels even better to come back. That's all from me for now. Thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum. Have you ever felt the need to use the same speed of Wi-Fi when using cellular data? Imagine having a fast and accessible Wi-Fi connection everywhere, which now is possible because of the future implementation of 5G in Brunei Darussalam. Without further ado, I am Vanida and I will be presenting the topic, How is 5G wireless technology comparable to Wi-Fi? To begin with, 5G from the word itself means the fifth generation of mobile network that serves the purposes of delivering higher speed, more reliability and massive network capacity, whereas Wi-Fi allows internet connectivity through a wireless router. Given the technology-filled age that we live in, the demand for a reliable, high-performing internet connection with minimum lag is ongoing, and so is 5G versus Wi-Fi debate. Since 5G network has not been introduced to many countries yet, I will only use the fact based on South Korea where 5G is launched. Here are some of the advantages of 5G higher speeds, low latency, and enhanced capacity. But for today, I will only be explaining about its higher speed. So, this is a bar chart of 5G download speed that I obtained from OpenSignal. As you can see, the higher the number means the faster it is. And 5G is indeed way faster than Wi-Fi and 4G. Let's take video conferencing as an example. Zoom application has risen to the top of the market due to social distancing during the coronavirus pandemic. Since there are a lot of Zoom users nowadays, people are having trouble with frozen screen and poor quality audio. That is why, with the help of 5G, we will be experiencing a whole new level of social networking experience as if we are talking in front of each other. Lastly, 5G indeed holds enormous promise. Although, it, although IP licensing costs associated with mobile technologies make cellular infrastructure more expensive than their Wi-Fi counterparts, it can be concluded from my earlier points that Wi-Fi and 5G technologies will continue to be strong complements to each other. But of course, but of course, there are expectations to these generalizations. At the end of the day, whether to use 5G or Wi-Fi depends on the specific use case as well as the individual itself. That's it from me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Muhammad Aizan and I'm going to present to you using holographic teaching as a tool of, a tool of during pandemic. So, have you ever thought of becoming Tony Stark with a touchable and, mo and a movable hologram when you can swipe and move it from here to there until your grandma come to your until your grandma come to your room and give you a puzzle look like bahapa kian? <laughs> so, the idea of using hologram as an education tool is quite interesting, especially for me, because of that, I'm going to tell you some of the advantage of using a hologram as a teaching tool. One of the advantages of using hologram is that it can give us interesting visual to look at. Now compared with our current online class, sometimes the teacher gives us a sheet of paper with a diagram or send us a, a picture. But now imagine with hologram. With hologram, we can use it. Uh, we can see the diagram in every angle, not just in every. Not just we can see it in 360 degrees, but also we can see the picture very clearly rather than the picture the teacher gave with black and white that the teacher expect us to know what that thing is. Another advantage of using hologram is that it, is make, it can make study more fun and interactive. Don't you find it exciting when you have a room full of holographic diagram all around you? 
when you have when you have a picture on your left, a statistic on your right, and well the text on your right, and finally you have a drawable teacher in front of you. <laughs> then lastly, uh, an advantage of using hologram is that it is more realistic. So now again we look at our current online class. In online class, some or maybe most of the students tend to lose focus when they are studying. So with, with the help of hologram, the student can concentrate more to the studying because they feel like they're being watched by the teacher since it's realistic. So in conclusion, there might be, there might be other advantage of using hologram, but I guess this is enough to make people inspired or eager to have hologram as a teaching tool. So I hope one day everyone will have hologram as their teaching, uh, well, using hologram for their teaching, or maybe we can use it and uh, maybe we can use it without going to school. Yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I don't want to alarm all of you, but the person next to you might be a liar. How would I know that? Maybe I would know if I use a lie detection tool, like the ones investigators use. To the questions, how is this a probable way to suspect criminals and the reliability of these tools crosses in your mind? Well, you are lucky. I'm Adriana. Today, we'll be diving into my topic, lie detection tools for interrogation purposes. I understand the top, I understand the generalization of this topic, but I will elaborate as much as I can. I have been watching crime documentaries for quite some time and have always been curious about how police are confident enough to arrest someone without any doubts. Is it just through interviews or DNA testing? After a few years of watching crime documentaries, I discovered that Light detection tools have been quite an important tool to use during an interrogation, especially in the America. One of them is a polygraph test, which measures and records several physiological indicators, such as the blood pressure and pulse, while a person is asked a series of questions. Moreover, this, there is also an alternative tool, which is the guilty knowledge test that is used in Japan. However, the accuracy of these tools have been long controversial, and most psychologists agree that there is little evidence that polygraph tools can accurately detect lies. The reason for this is that there are no specific physiological reactions associated with lying. Now, I'm going to bring it back to the 1970s, where a criminal case was using a polygraph test on a suspect. However, unfortunately, it gave the officers reasonable doubt of his guilt, and he was let go. After 44 long years, the case was solved through DNA testing, and investigators found out that the suspect was, in fact, the perpetrator of the said crime. That being said, despite the low accuracy, polygraph tools were the holy grail for the investigators since there was no dependable DNA testing. Our neighboring country, Malaysia, also uses polygraph tests to investigate serious crimes, and a famous example is the Lahad Datu incursion. If you ask me if polygraph tests are reliable, I would say it's better than nothing, right? Yes. Even though it can pressure suspects to be truthful, there are still more enhancements needed to improve polygraph testing, starting from how to distinguish different physiological reactions of people. Now that you have an insight into lie detection tools, do you think it will benefit our criminal justice system? In my perspective, bringing the tools to our country will be a great implementation for the future because of the 80% reliability and the range of decisions it can give to investigators. That's all from me. Thank you.
Have you ever wondered you can, you can charge your phone on a window using sunlight? The answer to that, yes, you can. Assalamu alaikum, and my name is Muhammad Denel, and I'm here to present my speech on electricity efficiency through solar transmission. Does anyone know who invented the solar panel? Solar panel was invented by Edmund Becquerel in 1839. He found that the cell metal electrode produced more electricity when it, when it was exposed to sunlight. Which begs the question, how does it work? Firstly, we need the sun and solar panel to observe the energy. The energy then will convert the electrical current to power your home. Example, you can charge your phone and switch on the light. What are the benefits of using solar panel? It is environmentally friendly because it does not produce greenhouse gas emission, which means it automatically reduces our dependency on fossil fuel. In Brunei, we mainly use fossil fuel to generate electricity, which contribute to the current climate crisis. Furthermore, using solar panel help to protect the environment and ultimately improve our well-being. Using solar panel also help to decrease our carbon footprint and indirectly save the environment. That is why it benefits us more if we install and use solar panel. Additionally, using solar panel also cost-friendly. By installing solar panel, we can eliminate or reduce our electricity bill. Likewise, solar panels are long-lasting and require little upkeep. But these can be handled by the manufacturer, such as SunPower, REC, which offer 20 to 25 years of warranty. In 2008, the Netherlands government started using solar energy, in, and in return in 2009, they have the biggest solar installation and is operational throughout the country. I hope in Brunei, I hope in the future, Brunei will be the one of the countries that utilize the sun as our main source of energy. Save the world as it only one we have left. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Muhammad Nazir Begum.